Well, thanks. Being an economist, you actually do get a lot of opportunities to say, I told you so, um, for better or worse. Um, I, I'll have to uh, have tough competition, I guess, tonight with uh, going against the president, but uh, we try not to go too long so you can still catch the end of it, and then I'll tell you everything tomorrow. You can read my blog and see everything that he got wrong. All right, well, what I want to do, I'm talking about the housing crash recession, and I will make a few points here that are somewhat different how most people talk about it. Um, first and foremost, I want to emphasize the fact that it was a housing crash recession. It's amazing to me that so many people who miss the housing bubble, even today, still don't seem to recognize the housing bubble, which you wouldn't think was hard, but, but uh, I think you have a lot of people that do that. The other point that I'm going to make in, as I go on, I'll, I'll talk about this a little more in a moment, but it, I emphasize that was housing and not finance. Um, I don't know how many people talk about this as a financial crisis. We had a financial crisis. We have problems with our financial system. But first and foremost, the story is housing. Um, it's not finance, and I think that's very important in terms of how we think about how we got here and also how we think about the solution. The solution isn't just to fix our financial system, although that would be helpful, but that, that by itself is not going to fix the economy. Okay, so to outline the main points I want to make, first off that it, would have, it should have been easy to see the bubble. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why I saw it, how I saw it. And while I think everyone, I don't mean like you know, people who work, do other jobs for a living, come home and watch the news for a few minutes or read the paper, I mean economists, you know, people who do what I do for a living. We should have all seen the bubble. Um, it, it was hard to miss. Um, the second point is that it did propel the economy, that uh, from 2002 to 2007, uh, the housing bubble propelled the economy. I, I often talk about our economy as being bubble propelled because in, in the 90s, it was propelled by a stock bubble. We had the stock bubble collapse in 2000, 2001, and the economy didn't really pick up again until the housing bubble gained enough steam that it could propel the economy going forward. So it's really the driving force in the economy through 2007, which leads us to the third point, that when the housing bubble collapsed, that it gave us the recession we're in today. So it was the housing bubble first and foremost. We had a lot of you know, people running around when Bear Stearns went under, when Lehman went under, you know, we had the financial crisis. First and foremost, it was the housing bubble, the collapse of the housing bubble that gave us the downturn. And that's, of course, my last point, that the financial issues are secondary. Not altogether unimportant. I'm not going to say it's unimportant if you had your financial system collapse, but I was just reading, uh, we had uh, Timothy Geithner and, and former Secre Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson were testifying today about the collapse of AIG. And they said, well, you know, it's really unfortunate we had to bail them out with all those taxpayer dollars, but if we didn't do that, we, wouldn't, we would have had a second Great Depression. Well, that's a great thing to say if you want to justify your actions, but I don't know anyone who could tell me how that would have given us a second Great Depression. So I'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail. I, it, basically, they're making things up, as Sarah Palin would say. Okay, how could you have seen that there, there was a housing bubble? Um, not very hard. This is real house prices. This is adjusted for inflation. Um, Case Shiller is one of the indices. There's different indexes you could use. Uh, I won't go into details about the indexes. But this inflation adjusted index, 10 major cities, all the other indices would show you pretty much the same thing. The point here is if you take a nationwide index of house prices, you see that they began to outpace the overall rate of inflation. So I'm saying real house prices. That means I'm adjusting house prices for inflation. So if inflation was 3% a year and house prices rose 3% a year, this graph would be completely flat. It'd be at 100. It'd be at exactly 100. So I've adjusted for inflation. And what you see is that house prices begin to outpace inflation. In this index, about 98. Another index would be about 96. But the point is, in the late 90s, house prices begin to outpace inflation, interestingly coinciding with the stock bubble. And then at their peak, at least by this index, they've more than doubled in real terms. By other indexes, they've increased by about 70 or 80 percent after adjusting for inflation. Now, why should this have been a real big warning sign to economists, to people watching this? Well, first and foremost, they should have, it should have been a warning sign because we have history on this. We could see what had happened to nationwide house prices. Actually, we had data going back, or Robert Schiller, an economist at Yale University, constructed a data set going back 100 years to 1896. And he found from 1896 to 1996, house prices, nationwide at least, had just kept even with the overall rate of inflation. It's a long time, OK, 100 years. Nationwide house prices. So again, we could find pockets. You know, certainly New York City 
house prices rose more rapidly than inflation in California, the coastal properties. We could certainly find those pockets, but there were other areas where they rose less rapidly. So if you took a nationwide average of house prices for this 100-year period, you find that they just tracked the overall rate of inflation. That's really big. This is not a small market. It's the largest market in the world, the U.S. housing market. It's the largest market in the world, and it's a real long period of time. Okay, so we could look back over 100 years and see house prices had just tra tracked the overall rate of inflation. Suddenly, we get this period beginning in the late 90s and accelerating in this decade, or I guess it's the last decade now, where house prices begin to suddenly hugely outpace the overall rate of inflation. Should have set off all sorts of alarm bells. Why is this happening? And, you know, sort of simple story. You go, well, let's look at the fundamentals of the market. Let's look at supply and demand. So starting with the supply side, well, is there some reason to think we can't build houses at the same pace as we had previously? I, I heard Alan Greenspan, this is actually why I first started looking at the housing market very closely. Alan Greenspan gave testimony before Congress on this in 2002. And he said, well, you know, we have environmental restrictions on building. So you go, well, that's an interesting story. Um, does that really fit? Um, remember, in 1994, the Republicans took over Congress. Republicans also took over many state houses. Republicans tend not to be big environmentalists. This was not exactly the heyday of environmentalism. So Alan Greenspan was certainly correct. We have environmental restrictions on building, but that was true in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. We did not get a housing bubble in those decades. So environmental restrictions on building were not new, and there's certainly no evidence that somehow they had become more stringent, they made it more difficult to build homes in the 90s and in the last decade than they had in prior decades. The other thing Greenspan said about supply was, well, there's a limited supply of buildable land, you know, in desirable locations. So if you want to live in Manhattan, you know, there's a limit. That's, of course, a true statement, but there was always a limited amount of land in Manhattan. You know, so this wasn't new. In other words, so, so there wasn't really a story. And if we really wanted to check this, you didn't have to go too far. The government has very good data on the number of homes. They put out every month, the, the Commerce Department puts out data, how many housing starts do we have? And if you looked at that data, you'd see that at least over the years 2002 to 2006, we were building homes at a near record pace. So the story that there was somehow some limit on supply that was pushing up prices, it was obviously nonsense on its face. Okay, so you go, okay, well, let's take a look at the other side of the, the market, the demand side. Is, is there something on the demand side that's increased demand so much that, you know, that we're seeing this big run up in house prices? Well, two major components of demand, income, population. Okay, income. Was income growth very rapid? Well, late 90s, we had several years of relatively good income growth. So if you take the years 96 to 2000, incomes actually were rising. Um, not an extraordinary pace. They weren't rising any more rapidly than they did in the 50s and 60s when we had no housing bubble. But, you know, you could at least point to income growth. When you get to this decade or the last decade, income growth actually stops. We have the recession in 2001, and income growth stops, income stagnates, and actually declines a little for most families. So you really didn't have an income story. Okay, so the last, last thing you could look at on, uh, on the demand side, the other thing you could look at, what about population? You know, are we seeing a big population boom? Well, I do, one of the other areas I do work in is Social Security, and the whole story of Social Security is this huge baby boom cohort. You know, I'm one of them. We're getting older. Um, people are approaching retirement. Their kids have moved away. If you wanted to tell a population story, you could have maybe said that if we had a big run-up in prices in the 70s or 80s when the baby boomers were first forming their own, own households, you know, own families. You can't tell that story in 2002, 2003. Two, it didn't make any sense. Um, one of the things Alan Greenspan threw out was immigrants, which, you know, again, it was kind of like, well, A, there aren't that many immigrants, and B, most of the people are just coming over and not buying $400,000 homes. So didn't work, didn't fit very well. Okay, so, so that should have set off, you know, some warnings here that, you know, things weren't quite right. Okay, well, what else could you look at? Vacancy rates. Okay, again, don't have to look very far. The, the Commerce Department releases vacancy rates every quarter. What you saw during this period was vacancy rates were rising very, very to record levels. The, the upper line here, by the way, is, uh, is rental units. The lower line is ownership units. And you see mostly, most of the movements on the rental side, but rental vacancy rates were actually very high through the late 90s. And then at the beginning of this decade, they actually rose to record levels, and they're still at pretty much record highs. 
Um, ownership units have less movement, um, but they began to rise in 2005 and also hit record levels in the last few quarters. Okay, we could forgive them in 2002 for not seeing that on the ownership side. But certainly on the rental side, we had record, very high vacancy rates and hitting records early in, in the last decade. So again, that should have raised the warning. And let me just say a little bit about rental and ownership units. At the end of the day, housing can switch back and forth between rental and ownership, and it often does. So anyone who was looking at this and said, well, that's the rental side, well, think about that for a second. If, if you have vacancies on the rental side, rental units can be converted to ownership units. If you have an apartment building and you're sitting there and no one wants to rent your place and you see that the condo across the street is selling at record prices, well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out why don't you turn your apartments into condos. And of course, that happened a lot of places. So at the end of the day, we have one housing stock. And if it turns out to be the case that we have a lot of vacancies on the rental side, people can't get a good rent or landlords think they aren't getting enough in rent and they see sale prices are going through the roof, they'll convert the rental units to ownership units. So again, this should have been a warning sign. This isn't consistent with the story that we have a shortage of housing pushing up prices to record levels. Okay, well, another part of the story, uh, what's going on with rents? Again, I have sales prices. These are also real prices, inflation adjusted prices. And the answer with rents is basically nothing, that there was a little bit of increase in rents late 90s, early part of this decade. From 2002 onward, they were flat or slightly downward. Okay, so again, if we thought there were fundamentals in the housing market driving up house prices, it doesn't show up in rents, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, it doesn't have to be one for one. If we see that house prices have gone up 70%, we don't necessarily expect that rents would go up 70%, but we should expect to see something comparable, maybe 30%, maybe 40%, 50%. We should see substantial upward pressure on rents. We don't see that. This is nationwide. I'll just show you a couple cities. Uh, Miami, this is the boom through bust. Um, you see that, again, these are real also. Uh, Miami prices uh, went through the roof. They, they more than doubled between 96 and, and uh, their peak in 2006. Rents barely went anywhere okay, through this period. Um, same story in Phoenix. Phoenix uh, prices went up 80%. Um, rents actually fell a little bit adjusted for inflation. Okay, I could show you any number of other cities you'd have the same story. So the long and short, if you thought that this run up in house prices was being driven by a shortage of housing, by supply and demand in, in, in the housing market, you really don't have any evidence for it. Everything is going the other way. And again, this is a huge departure from past practice. You should have seen that something, else, something was wrong. Now let me mention one other thing that people did often raise as not necessarily quite a fundamental factor, but an argument that it wasn't a bubble. A lot of people said that, well, we had extraordinarily low interest rates during this period. And that's actually true. So if you look back at the, the mortgage rates or long-term rates, uh, mortgage rates at that time fell to they hit a low of about 5.25 on a 30-year mortgage. Those were the lowest rates we'd seen since the mid-50s. So you could point to that and say, well, that was, that was important. We had low interest rates. There are two problems with that story. Uh, the first problem was that if we look back over, over you know, the, the 50 years where we have decent data, the post-war period, post-World War II period, we don't find that house prices were very responsive to interest rates. So you have periods in, in uh, the, the late 70s where nominal interest rates were very high. Real interest rates actually weren't because we had a lot of inflation. But that didn't seem to have much effect on house prices. That flipped over in the 80s. Real interest rates were very high. Um, that didn't seem to have much effect on house prices. So there's a lot of literature on this. In general, it's found that interest rates did not seem to have much effect on house prices. So you could look back. We had a lot of data on this. So if you want to tell the story that, oh, don't worry about this big run-up in house prices, that's explained by the fall in interest rates. Um, OK, the data doesn't seem to support that. You wouldn't have had evidence. But the other probably more important reason why that would not have been a very good story for anyone to tell is that no one expected interest rates to stay low. Okay, so if you look at the projections, and we have them, I mean, we have projections from the Bush administration, the Federal Reserve Board, the Congressional Budget Office, any number of private forecasters, no one expected interest rates to stay low. Everyone expected that the economy would pick up in growth and that interest rates would edge upward, which is actually what happened. So if you look at what happened to, to the mortgage rate 
after you know it hit its low in, in uh, 2003, you look what happened to the 30-year mortgage, 2004, 2005, 2006, it went back up to more normal levels. So if you thought that for some reason now interest rates were having this huge effect on house prices, they never had in the past, but you thought for some reason they were having this huge effect on house prices, well, everyone expected interest rates to go back up, so it was the same thing. You would have expected house prices to plummet. So that really didn't give you a way out. There was no way out. Okay, well, a little bit more about why, you know, I, I'm going to beat up on Ben Bernanke here because he's about to get reappointed as Fed chair tomorrow. Why Ben Bernanke? By the way, he was, he was only chair of the Fed from January of 2006, but I blame him for a lot of this. Greenspan is, of course, the primary villain. But Ben Bernanke was a member, one of the seven board of gov members of the Board of Governors from 2002. So he was there the whole time. He wasn't the chair, but he was a very important official at the Fed and he basically totally concurred with the Fed's policy on this, and that was just let the bubble grow. Okay, well, the other part of the story that he absolutely should have seen was the proliferation of bad mortgages. Um, we all know the story now, and you have this great, you know, that you, I might be dating myself, but I expect people here are familiar with Casablanca? Okay, okay, so you, so you know the scene where, where, they, where he's in, uh, they have the French, uh, the police captain who's, uh, decides to shut down Rick's Cafe and he goes, there's gambling here, I'm shocked, I'm shocked, you know. Okay, well, this is the story, like, how could you not have known of the bad mortgages? I mean, this is just utterly absurd. I'll just give you a couple statistics here. Uh, subprime, you know, which the, this is the, the main villain you've heard of now, people maybe not have heard of, uh, heard of subprime mortgages three or four years ago. Subprime mortgages given typically to people with bad credit rating. A lot of this has to do with discrimination, long, complex story. I won't go into all that. But basically, these are people who are considered bad credit risk. That used to be about 7 or 8% of the market. That exploded to be a quarter of the market at the peak of the bubble in 2006. Okay, how could you not know that? You're Alan Greenspan, you're Ben Bernanke. This is public data. This is not, you know, you don't have to go investigating. I knew of this. You know, I don't have any special, you know, security clearance. You know, this is publicly available data. How could the Federal Reserve Board, how could Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, not know that subprime had just exploded from 7 or 8% of the market to a quarter of the market? How could you not know that? He actually told a Washington Post reporter they just discovered this in January of 06. This is Greenspan, Greenspan now, just as he was leaving office. And just going like, you can't really mean that. I mean, what were you doing if you didn't know this? Now, the, the other statistic that I think is even more, even stranger, have people heard of Alt-A mortgages? Okay, well, these are even more dicey. Alt-A are a strange category. Alt-A, in principle, it's someone who's between subprime and prime. And typically, Alt-A mortgages were about 1% or 2% of the market. And usually, someone got an Alt-A mortgage, not necessarily because they had a low income, but because they couldn't fully document their, their income, they couldn't get full documentation when they're taking out a loan. Now, the conventional wisdom, I don't know if anyone's actually documented this, but the conventional wisdom on Alt-A mortgages is that the reason someone gets an Alt-A mortgage typically is that they're a small business owner, and the reason they can't fully document their income is because they're cheating on their taxes. Okay, so suppose your income last year, the year before, was 150000 You reported to the IRS that you made 60000 Okay, so you come into the bank and you say, I want to take out a mortgage. You go, what's your income? They go, well, it's 150000 They go, well, can you show us your tax returns? Uh, no. Okay, well, that happens. And what happens with the bank is they go, okay, well, we'll give you the mortgage because you're telling us this and we kind of believe you and yeah, wink, wink, nod, nod, we understand. Um, but we have to charge you a higher interest rate, one to two percentage points higher. Okay, so if you know this, this is a true story. You know, a true story. You're lying about your 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 income to the IRS. Um, you might go ahead and take that deal. Now, Alta exploded from one or two percent of the market to fifteen percent of the market at the peak of the bubble in 2006. Now, were there really that many people that could not document their income? Okay, was there, did that suddenly go from 1% or 2% of the market to 15%? We didn't have an explosion of small businesses, so I can answer that one right off the bat. We didn't have an explosion of small businesses. So was there really that many more people? Were there really that many more people who wanted to buy homes who couldn't document their income? It's a little hard to believe. Basically, yet a lot more people were putting down information that wasn't true. Okay, now this wasn't so much on the borrower side, this was much more on the lender side. And this, this I'm basing on anecdotal evidence because I was writing about the housing bubble years ago and I was getting people from all over the country sending me emails 
about their friend, their brother, their relative, who was a mortgage broker, who was being told by their boss, their supervisor, that they should write in numbers for people. So someone comes in and says, you know, their income's 50,000, well, that's not gonna be enough to get you a 300,000 mortgage. So they say, okay, well, we're gonna write down 100,000. Okay, so this was going on at a very large scale. Now, did Greenspan and Bernanke not know this? I don't have any investigative authority. It's almost inconceivable that they didn't know this. Okay, so this is all the more reason that they should have had some clue that something bad was gonna happen here. Okay, now I'll just say a little bit more about what was going on, because, you know, just to complete the picture, why is it that you had, you know, the countrywides, the new centuries, all these banks that were so happy to make subprime mortgages, make mortgages that, I should say, that they had good reason to believe people wouldn't be able to pay off? Well, you know, you know this story at this point. The reason they were happy to make those mortgages, issue those mortgages, they could sell them the next day in the secondary market. Okay, so they would sell them to the investment banks, to Citibank or Citigroup, to, to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, who would then package them into mortgage-backed securities, and Citibank and, and, and Morgan Stanley didn't care what was in there because they knew they could sell these all over the world to investors once they got a AAA rating from the bond agencies. Okay, so that sort of completes the picture here. Um, again, knowing the exact details, I didn't know all the details at the time. There, you know, one of the things I kicked myself, I didn't catch this, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which regulates the investment banks, that would be Goldman Sachs, uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman, uh, Morgan Stanley, and Merrill Lynch, the five major investment banks, um, they relaxed their rules on leverage in the middle of this in 2004. So it used to be the case that these, these institutions could only issue credit that was equal to 10 times their assets. They changed that, their capital, I'm sorry, 10 times their capital. They changed that to, to 40 times. So in the middle of this bubble, when you actually would have wanted them to be tightening down, they actually went the other way and eased up and said, go ahead and you know, make a lot more loans, get much more heavily leveraged. And of course, those were the, the institutions that got hit hardest. Of course, uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman actually went out of business, and the other three were just saved really with the support of the government. Okay, so anyhow, but that, that's sort of the basic story of what happened there. There should not have been any big surprises. Now, let me go on about how that drove the economy. Oh, I'm sorry. Jumped, should jump ahead and say a little bit about commercial real estate because um, this, is, this is just kind of painful. I won't go into the same depth on this. When you, had the, when you had the tailing off of the boom, the building boom in residential real estate, you saw the exact same thing go on in commercial real estate where you had this big run up in prices and a big run up in buildings. So, what happened here, this is uh, constant dollars. You see that we, we had an increase in construction, non-residential non construction from about 240 billion a year to almost 340 billion a year, about a 40% increase in the span of about two and a half years. What you had was a bubble in non-residential real estate following immediately on the bubble in residential real estate. So it, what happened was as soon as you had some tapering off of construction in the residential sector, Everyone, there was pent up demand in non-residential sector, so there was a big building boom in office space, in hotel space, in retail space, there's all these malls all over the country, and you now have record vacancy rates in retail space, office space, hotel space, um, and that's also crashing, compounding the downturn on the economy. Okay, well how is this driving the economy? Um, housing drives the economy two ways. Um, one, just the most obvious, the direct way that when we had this run up in house prices, as I said before, we had construction at near record levels. So construction had been, if you look back to the mid 90s before house prices really got out of whack, construction had been around three and a half percent of GDP. At its peak, construction in 2005, this is residential now, was over six percent, it's about 6.2 percent of GDP. So what does that translate to, let's say, a gap of two and a half percentage points of GDP? That translates in, in, into about 400 billion a year in additional construction. Okay, so that was driving the economy over this period, or one of the factors driving the economy over the period 2002 to 2006. We had this big construction boom in the residential sector. The other way in which the housing, housing bubble drove the economy was through consumption. Um, you had these endless lectures, a lot of people run around complaining how Americans are spendthrifts, they're not saving enough, blah, blah, blah. 
there was some truth to that, of course, but there was a reason why they weren't saving, and that was because their house prices had gone through the roof. And there's a well-known housing wealth effect. This is, goes back, I don't even know how far the literature goes back, at least 50 years, might even be further than that. There's a well-known housing wealth effect that says that people will spend between five to seven cents for each dollar of housing wealth they have. So each year their consumption will increase by between five to seven cents. Now, my calculations are that at its peak in 2006, the housing bubble created more than $8 trillion of housing bubble wealth. So in other words, if you took the gap between the market wealth of the housing stock at the peak of the bubble and what it would have been if housing had just followed its trend path, that gap was equal to about $8, billion, $8 trillion. I'm sorry if I said billion, $8 trillion. So if you just do the arithmetic on that, you say you have a housing wealth effect between five and seven cents on the dollar, and we have $8 trillion of housing wealth, housing bubble wealth, that means that annual consumption is gonna increase by between 400 billion and 560 billion a year because of your housing bubble. And that's what's reflected in this graph. So you see at 2006, I won't go into the distinction here between the savings rate and the adjusted savings rate. For the moment, let me just focus on the adjusted savings rate and tell you that's the better measure. But 2006, you see that the adjusted savings rate essentially hit zero. Okay, if you go back to the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, you see that the savings rate had hovered around eight, nine, 10%. So suddenly we're at zero. Why are we at zero? We're at zero because we have all this housing bubble wealth. And this wasn't an irrational thing to do, by the way. I should point out, you know, they're condemning people for being spendthrift. Well, Alan Greenspan and everyone else was telling them that this, you know, these house prices were going to stick, that they were going to stay high. So you bought a home for $200,000. Today it's worth four hundred. dollars Why shouldn't you borrow against your home? Why shouldn't you take $30,000 out and take a, you know, get a new car, you know, pay for your kid's education? It's not a bad thing to do. Um, maybe take a real nice vacation, you know, spend repairing your home, do whatever. Why shouldn't you do that? You know, everyone is telling you that house prices will just keep going up. Perfectly rational thing to do, okay? Unless you realize that it's a housing bubble and all that wealth is gonna disappear. Okay, so what happens after house prices begin to fall in 06? Well, the saving rates begin to rise. Okay, so this was totally predictable effect of the collapse of the housing bubble, that on the one hand, you had a collapse of construction. So I was saying a moment ago that at its peak, at, at the peak of the bubble, construction was over 6% of GDP. If you look at the most recent data, construction is less than 3% of GDP. Three percentage points of GDP, it's about 450 billion a year in annual demand. This graph, if we look at the savings rate, we're up around five or 6%. Well, 6% of disposable income is around 600 billion so if we just add those two together, we've lost over a trillion dollars a year in demand due to the collapse of, the, of residential construction and the fall off in, 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 consum in, in consumption. Okay, this is all totally predictable. That's why I keep emphasizing this. We're getting Ben Bernanke reappointed. We have this complete disaster because Bernanke and Greenspan ignored this bubble and ignored what was almost a guaranteed outcome. I mean, you can't write down the exact numbers that you would have seen. But something like this was an entirely predictable scenario. Okay, well, where does this leave us? Um, I, I made these slides uh, a week or so ago. The Congressional Budget Office just came out with new numbers, and they would be worse. Um, where this leaves us is with a severe recession that's not likely to end anytime soon. I should be careful here. The economy's growing, we're out of the recession. We're in a situation where we have high unemployment, which is going to remain high for the foreseeable future. The new numbers, the Congressional Budget Office just came out with their numbers yesterday. Th these were taken from the Congressional Budget Office, as you can see. Um, their new projection is that for 2011, I think the average unemployment rate, these are year-round averages, would be 9.3%. And 2012, they're projecting as a year-round average 8%. Okay, this is an incredibly bad story. And just to give you an idea of how bad this is, if you go back when the economy first started to slow in, at the end of 2007 and early 2008, we rushed out, Congress rushed out a stimulus package. President Bush is still in the White House. He signed it. Congress rushed out a stimulus package signed by President Bush in February of 2008 when the unemployment rate was 4.8%. Okay, so Congress and President Bush thought that unemployment was enough of a problem at 4.8% that they thought they had to have a stimulus package. Here we're looking at the projections, again, using the new numbers from the Congressional Budget Office, 2012. So 
two years from now, more than two years from now, we're still going to have 8% unemployment. They don't project that unemployment will get back to a more normal level until 2014 or 2015. Okay, so that's, that's a, a pretty incredible story in terms of the severity of the downturn. Okay, well, let me just say a couple more things on this and, and then stop for questions. Um, first off, you know, what I've tried to emphasize here is that this was a totally predictable set of events. And I focused on the real economy because I think that the financial story is secondary. You know, you had the fireworks around uh, Bear Stearns collapsing. You know, the big investment bank collapsed in, in March of 2008. In the summer of uh, 2008, or I guess it was actually September of 2008, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the mortgage giants collapsed. Um, and then Lehman Brothers, of course, uh, the next week. And then AIG at the edge of collapse, the huge insurance company. That got all the fireworks. But that really was secondary. Okay, we keep hearing this story. We could have had a Great Depression. And I keep saying to everyone who tells me that, I, I have a joke, how do you make someone look less articulate than Sarah Palin being interviewed by, by Katie Couric? Ask them how we would have gotten the Great Depression. You know, you have any number of people who like confidently assert that. Thank God we had Ben Bernanke and Timothy Geithner there, otherwise we would have had great, how, how? Because I don't know the how. You know, if someone here knows the how, you could tell me that when we have the questions. I don't know the how. Um, I don't see how that would have given us a second Great Depression, unless we did a lot of really other stupid things. We could have done a lot of, you know, you give me a list of 20 other stupid things, that would give us a Great Depression. But I can't see anything they did that had they not done it, we would have gotten the Great Depression. Okay, so, so first part it's not, is that it's not finance. The second part, and this is, this is um, I won't go on at length about this, although I could. What's really incredible to me is that we know how to get out of this. When I first took economics, back when I was an undergrad, you know, I read Keynes and read about the Great Depression, and I thought, God, weren't they really stupid? If only they had listened to Keynes, you know, because basically when you have a story of unemployment, all you really have to do is spend money. Okay, and that was basically what Keynes, I mean, to make it as simple as possible, obviously, he's, you know, he's a very, you know, sophisticated thinker, and he wrote at great length, and, you know, there's more to his argument than that, but the long and short is, you know, this is a story where we're demand constrained. Usually, usually economists talk about, you know, we have scarce resources. We'd like to have another house, but, you know, there's not enough land, or we can't get construction workers, or, you know, we need things, but there's not, there's scarcity. The story of the Great Depression was that there was no scarcity. All we needed was demand. And Keynes actually, you know, he joked about this. We could pay people to dig holes and fill them up again, and that would create employment and increase output. Stupid thing to do because we could pay people to do something constructive, but it's better to have them do something that's, you know, wasteful than have people be unemployed. Well, you know, the lesson that I thought everyone took away from this is yes, we can get out of the Great Depression. Unfortunately, what finally created the demand to get us out of the Great Depression was World War II. I mean, that's what finally took to get the government to spend enough money. Okay, but there's no magic about spending it on war. The point was you spent money. It didn't matter whether you spent it on war or spent it building roads. The point was to spend money. We finally did that, but only under the pressure of World War II. But I thought we had all walked away with the lesson that you just need to spend money. Now, the incredible thing that I, I'm finding today, and I'm sort of glad I'm here with you rather than listening to President Obama, because I think he knows the lesson, but for political reasons, I don't think he's prepared to say the lesson. Instead of spending money, we're yelling about budget deficits. And that's exactly what they did back in the Great Depression. And that's why it lasted for a decade rather than a year or two years. So we have kind of a remarkable story here that we had unbelievable stupidity on the part of economic policymakers that got us into this. And we're consider continuing to see the same sort of stupidity which is leading to double-digit unemployment rather than getting the economy back on its feet. So I'll stop with that, and I'll let someone tell me how Ben Bernanke averted the Great Depression. Thanks. No questions? I know you all agree with everything I said. Yes, indeed. Well, the problem, the question I assume you're taking is, should we have big tax cuts or should we have uh, spending? Um, let, let me put it this way. There's different ways you could do tax cuts, different ways you could do spending. 
if you just did tax cuts across the board, there's a lot of data to show that people will save most of it. So what that means is if we, you know, let's pick a number here. Suppose we throw 500 billion on the table, say, okay, we're gonna 500 billion, we could either spend it in some manner or we could have tax cuts, and we're just gonna say do cross the board tax cut. Well, the evidence is that people will save a lot of that money. And particularly that's likely to be true now because you have so many people that have seen much of their wealth disappear. So you have a lot of people that thought they had 200,000 in equity in their home, but because their house price fell by 30% or 40%, they, find they have almost no equity. The money they had in the stock market's worth much less. And you know, this is someone in their 50s, you know, we have our huge baby boom cohort that's rapidly approaching retirement. We give them a tax break, the evidence is they're likely to save a lot of it. So on the other hand, if we took the money and spent it building a road, weatherizing homes, doing various other things, we know at least that, that will be spent. Now, again, you could do things that are better or worse. My actual preferred way of doing things is, is to give a tax cut to, to businesses to have workers work shorter hours. Um, this is actually something that uh, Germany and Netherlands have done very successfully, work share it's called. And what they do is instead of, instead of paying unemployment benefits, uh, those countries like the United States, if you lose your job, you get a benefit from the government. Instead of paying workers to be unemployed, they pay companies to keep people employed but working shorter hours. So you work, instead of working 40 hours a week, let's say you work 32 hours a week, and the government makes up most of the gap. So maybe you're taking home a few percent less, but you're working 20% fewer hours, and that way you keep everyone employed. So that takes sort of, that kind of splits the difference here. It's sort of a tax break to business that in principle is supposed to go to workers. So in any case, I think we could do better or worse ways, and obviously we want to try and find the most efficient ways we can. Yes. What percentage of the problem was caused by greed? Well, in a certain sense, I'd say it was all caused by greed in the sense that, you know, people thought they were going to make money. Now, we, we have a capitalist economy, so you expect, you know, it's, it's not new that businesses expect to make money. Um, I, I, I think what might have been new or different was, you know, maybe a degree of callousness that, you know, it's hard to believe, and I don't know any of these people, or at least not well enough to get a straight answer from them, but you know, if you were to talk to the people at Countrywide, that was one of the big subprime issuers. Did you not really know that you're getting people in mortgages they wouldn't be able to pay, you know, or take it up a step, you know, Goldman Sachs, where they were packaging these mortgages into mortgage-backed securities. Did you really not have a clue? You know, or we actually know, because uh, there was testimony by some of the people at the bond rating agencies, I think it was Moody's, I might be maligning the wrong one, but I believe it was Moody's, where they, the people that were actually rating the uh, collateralized debt obligations, these were complex instruments that were hard to understand, and um, the people who were rating them told their bosses that this is junk. We don't, you know, this is, you know, we, we can't give this investment grade ratings. Their bosses told them, give it an investment grade rating. So there are a lot of people, you know, we understand that banks are there to make money, you know, the bond rating agencies that run for profit, but they were ignoring, you know, what were considered at least professional ethics, at least previously. Now, how much, you know, were they really bound by that? If you go back 10 years, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I don't know. But there's at least this idea that there was some concern for professional ethics that clearly was thrown out the window, you know, certainly at the peak of the bubble. Yeah, you wanted to follow up on that? Okay, <laughs> I'll take your word on that. Yes. I've been really disappointed with uh, his plan for the financial sector. Uh, let, let me make a couple points. That first off, I, I really emphasize the bubble here because I think it's you know, and I keep saying how I'm really upset that Bernanke is being reappointed because I think first and foremost the biggest problem here was letting the bubble go unchecked. And the Fed could have done a lot to stem the bubble. In fact, I absolutely will say they could have stemmed the bubble had they wanted to, and there was nothing more important that they could have been doing or were doing during these years than preventing the growth of an $8 trillion housing bubble. So the fact that you reappoint Ben Bernanke is giving the wrong incentives. I mean, again, just try and be more concrete on this, as concrete as possible. What Ben Bernanke should have done, or Alan Greenspan before him, you know, the two were acting together, they should have done everything they could to go after this bubble. So that means first and foremost documenting it, showing there was a bubble. I had the data, they had much more data than I did. They employ hundreds of economists. 
They should have had them all producing papers, graphs, talking about this everywhere, you know, in their congressional testimonies or public speaking engagements. There's a real big bubble. Here's how we know this. We've never seen a run. They should have been doing that. They should have been cracking down on, the regu uh, on using the regulatory powers to crack down on these bad loans, which they had to know about. And they had regulatory power to do this, but they looked the other way. And if need be, if that still didn't reign in the bubble, they should have raised interest rates. And what they should have said was, we're going to raise interest rates as much as we have to to bring house prices down back to their trend level. What do you think of that, markets? And I think the markets would have thought of it. You know? So that's what they should have done. Now, they didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? Well, I don't know what was going on in their heads. But the one thing I could say for certain is, had they done that, Goldman Sachs would have been really angry. Countrywide would have been really angry. Citigroup would have been really angry. These are enormously powerful institutions. So had they done their job, they would have gotten the financial industry furious at them. And they all would have been running over to their friends in Congress, their friends in the White House, yelling, you got a nut over at the Federal Reserve Board. You got to rein them in. Okay, so it would have been very, very difficult for them to do the right thing. Now, they did the wrong thing. We had an absolutely disastrous result. What worse situation could you have than 10% unemployment? What worse situation could you have? Have an absolutely disastrous outcome. People have lost their life savings. I mean, this is really a horrible, horrible situation. And you still reappoint them. I mean, it's just astounding to me. So what that's telling, you know, our next Federal Reserve Board chair when they see a bubble, well, you could go up against, you know, Citigroup and J.P. Morgan and, you know, go ahead and take your risk. You know you'll get a lot of heat for that. Or you could just look the other way. And if things fall apart, you could just go, who could have known? So what's the next Fed chair going to do next time we see a bubble? Well, if we're economists and we believe people respond to incentives, we gave them incentives to do nothing. So we should presume they'll do nothing. Okay, a couple of the other things, you know, what I consider sort of big issues, I, I think the Obama administration is really just, you know, they're, they're doing more show things and substance things. So one of the issues is um, cre um, having uh, derivative instruments be exchange traded. One of the big stories here, the reason AIG went under was they were issuing these derivatives credit default swaps in huge numbers. I'd issue trillions of dollars, at least in nominal value, credit default swaps, totally unregulated. So what many people have argued is, well, this should be regulated. You should have credit default swaps, derivative instruments should be exchange traded so that we could see what's there. It's transparent to the markets. And if AIG tries to issue trillions of dollars that they can't back up, well, they won't be able to do it. Well, they passed, the, the, the bill that passed in the House has many derivatives being exchange traded, but basically it has a big exemption. It's called an end user exemption. So if you're an oil company, you could trade in oil derivatives and not have it on an exchange. Um, basically, this is the sort of thing you could take a truck through. So derivatives that banks or dealers don't want to be exchange traded will not be exchange traded because they aren't stupid people. They will have the, they'll take advantage of that exemption. The other, the other big thing that, you know, again, I think they've looked the other way on is the whole issue of too big to fail. Um, one of the big problems in this story is at the end of the day, you have people that are lending money to a JP Morgan, a Citigroup, one of these big banks. They aren't necessarily concerned about whether Citigroup or JP Morgan's a good credit risk because they know if they get in trouble, the government's going to pick up the tab. And that's exactly what happened in this crisis. What happened was obviously um, Lehman Brothers was the one big exception, but Bear Stearns would have gone bankrupt. The government stepped in. They arranged for JP Morgan to take it over. They gave a $30 billion loan. So if you made a loan to, to, to Bear Stearns, the big investment bank, the government covered it. Um, AIG, same story. So AIG, you know, they were being totally irresponsible, but you didn't have to care because at the end of the day, the government picked up the tab. We haven't done anything about too big to fail. President Obama is not willing to break up the large banks. So if you don't do anything about too big to fail, again, you don't have the market discipline that you'd want to see. Um, so I would say in, in many of the most important areas, I'll just mention one other that just is kind of mind boggling to me because it's so simple. One of the problems that we had during this period, I was talking about the bond rating agencies, they were giving investment grade ratings to junk. You know, so. Sometimes it was probably bad judgment, but we know at least in some cases they did that because they wanted the business. The basic problem here is, you know, you go to Citigroup, Moody's, the bond rating agency, sends someone over to Citigroup to rate their bonds, Citigroup is paying them. Okay, well, if you tell Citigroup, wait, these, are, these bonds are junk, 
Well, Citigroup's going to call your boss and go, hey, this guy rated our bonds as junk. You do this, we're, gonna, we're not going to do business with you anymore. Okay, well, that gives, that gives the bond rating agencies a real good incentive to doctor their ratings. Oh, yeah, it's all investment grade. And that, that's what happened, at least in one case we know with Moody's, and I suspect many cases. Real simple way to fix that. You just take away the hiring decision. Okay, so what would happen is if I'm Citigroup and I have this new mortgage-backed security and I want it rated by a bond rating agency, I don't pick the bond rating agency. I have someone else do it. I have, you know, we could have it be the stock exchange. It doesn't have to be the stock exchange, but that would be a reasonable party to do it. So I call up the New York Stock Exchange and say, I got a new mortgage-backed security. I need it rated. So they go, good, we'll send someone over. Okay, so that way I don't control the hiring. So the person from Moody's who comes over, he has no reason to lie. Because, you know, maybe he says it's junk and I get really angry, but next time I need an issue rated, I call up the New York Stock Exchange and they might send Moody's. So it doesn't matter that I'm angry. So that's a really, really simple thing. And for whatever reason, it's not on the table. So I don't really see the, the measures that, that President Obama has proposed as being really anything more than symbolic. I mean, some of them will do some good. The one, the one thing I will point to that I think will be beneficial is the idea of having a Consumer Financial Products Protection Agency, an agency that will look at these mortgages and say, look, this has to be transparent. You know, someone comes into the, to the bank and they take out a mortgage, they should be able to know what they're paying, what the penalty is if they pay late one month. That all should be transparent so that, you know, the people who come in there, you know, are, are going to understand it. So he supported that. That is in the uh, bill that the House passed. We'll see what ends up in the final version. But I think that, that would be a beneficial that would certainly be a beneficial reform. But many of the other reforms, I just really don't think go very far. Yes? In the second row. Yeah, um, people may have caught this last week. Uh, President Obama appeared with uh, Paul Volcker, the former Federal Reserve Board Chair, and Volcker has been a big advocate of reinstating the Glass-Steagall Act. What the Glass-Steagall Act did was separate out the normal commercial bank banking that most of us are familiar with, where you, you know, have a, a savings account, a checking account, borrow, uh, borrow money for a mortgage or student loan, whatever it might be, from investment banking, which is underwriting bonds and much more speculative and also involved in trading, uh, trading of stocks and bonds, much more speculative activity. And the argument for separating them is that the commercial banks are operated with the protection of the, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is guaranteed by the government and the Federal Reserve Board. And the idea is we want them to do simple, safe things. Investment banks had not been operated with that protection. So the idea was, okay, you know, if they want to speculate, if they want to go take bets on you know, currency or corn futures or whatever, that's fine, but if they get into problems, that's their problem, it's not the government's. Well, that was, that was required under Glass-Steagall, that was repealed in 1999, so we allowed investment banks and commercial banks to come together. And Volcker has been saying, no, we should restore that separation, and last week Obama endorsed what was called the Volcker Rule, where it said that commercial banks could not engage in, in trading on their own account. Now, the problem is that, once again, with the financial industry, these are sophisticated people. If you don't nail everything down, you're wasting your time. And they didn't nail everything down. Um, I, people are more expert on the nuts and bolts of this than I am. Explain to me how, basically, if you want to do speculation, exactly what you're not supposed to be able to do, it's very easy, at least in the rules as, as they were described. So again, it was a symbolic measure. I'm kind of of the view that, again, recognizing that regulators tend not to be the most courageous people, that if you really want to have the separation, you have to have the separation. You have to say, okay, commercial banking's over here, you do boring things, investment banking's over there, do whatever you want, but you're not protected by the government. Yeah, way in back. That's a real good question. Um, I, it's hard to, I'm sorry, the question was that uh, I, I wrote this, the, this column for uh, the Boston Review called the Big, big Bank Theory. 
And you know, I was arguing about how you have these implicit, pro implicit promise that too big to fail, a government guaranteed too big to fail, and then an explicit promise with uh, deposit insurance. And the question is, if, if you didn't have those, would you have had the same, the housing bubble expand to the same level? My guess would probably be no, but it's hard to, it's a, it's a little hard to answer that because you'd be talking about a totally different banking system. So, you know, but would you, could you have had the same sort of irrationality where no one's paying attention to the fact that house prices don't make any sense, that uh, the loans that are being issued don't make any sense? I'm sort of inclined to say no, but, you know, you, you, had, uh, you had the NASDAQ bubble, which didn't make any sense and didn't, to my knowledge at least, in any obvious way have any government guarantee. But, you know, so what would this have looked like had, had we not had any sort of implicit or explicit government guarantee? It's hard to say. Let me just say one other thing, though, because this was the context of that piece. I, the, the last three decades are often talked about a period of deregulation. And part of the theme I was trying to say in that piece was it really wasn't deregulation. You give the deregulators far too much credit when you say that was deregulation. Basically, what it was was a case where you had financial institutions that wanted the protection of the government, but they didn't want to pay for it. And deposit insurance just puts that most clearly, because what, what does it mean? The, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is insuring all these deposits. Well, there has to be a quid pro quo with that. They have to, we know that if they just told the banks, oh, we're going to insure your deposits, do whatever you want. Well, that's not deregulation. You're giving them free insurance. You know, and I liken this, I, I think I used this example in the piece, that this would be like I, I'm having a fireworks factory in my home and I'm just paying the regular residential insurance rate. Okay, well, that's not deregulation. That's cheating my insurance company. And in this case, the idea of deregulation, when you have, you know, at least in the case of uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, explicit insurance from the government, that's not deregulation. That's, you're, you want to rip off the government. So we should just be clear what's going on here. These aren't people who want deregulation. They want the financial industry to be able to rip off the government, which is what happened. Yes? Another woman over, like, the sixth row back. Let, let go. Okay, so the question is, what would have been the consequences if AIG had been, been left to fail? Well, I think there's two issues here. One is, like, what does that actually mean? You know, how much would we have let fail? I mean, would we just, you know, have a chain reaction? And two, what would be the eventual sort of longer-term response to whatever happened that day? So let's say at the moment that, you know, okay, it's, it's uh, I believe it was September 15th. It was the day after Lehman went under. AIG was about to go under. The Federal Reserve steps in. Suppose they said, no, we're just going to, you know, you, you, you had all, all these banks had, um, commitments from AIG, we're just going to let AIG go out of business and let go into bankruptcy and, you know, all these people that have obligations from AIG, they're worthless or, you know, maybe they'll get something from bankruptcy court eventually. Well, you probably would have seen other bankruptcies, most obviously the, uh, the big investment banks, uh, Goldman Sachs, probably uh, Morgan Stanley, I mean, I can't say for certain, but, you know, you would have had other bankruptcies. Um, so the question is, would we have let them go bankrupt? Um, you know, so, so the question is, you know, where do you stop? Do you just let them all go under? Um, if you'd let them all go under, I think there would have definitely been a serious hit to the economy. But the reason why I've always poo-pooed the idea of this being a second Great Depression is we know how to pick up the pieces. You know, back in the 30s, we really didn't. You know, that was pre-Keynes, and we were really struggling. Um, it would have, just to be clear, I think they did the right decision in not having this chain reaction of bankruptcies. But let's for the moment say that you made the wrong decision, in my view. Let there be a chain reaction of bankruptcies. You pick up the pieces. Uh, the downturn, the original, original downturn, which, you know, we're losing 600, 700,000 jobs a month. That was bad enough. It would have been worse. But we could have gotten the economy going again, one, by spending lots of money, two, by doing what they did back then, flood the banking system with liquidity, have the Federal Reserve Board inject you know, money into the system, but in this case, you'd be doing it after the banks collapsed rather than before. It would have been better to do it before, but, you know. So I don't see a Great Depression scenario there at all. We might have seen the unemployment rate instead of, well, it's likely to go still higher than it currently is. I mean, my guess is we'll get at least 10 and a half. It wouldn't shock me if we get 11. But instead of that, maybe we would go to 13, 14, but we could have brought it down. We wouldn't be sitting there with, you know, 13 or 14 percent unemployment for a whole decade like we did in the 30s. We could have brought it back down. So we definitely would have had a worse scenario, in my view, if we didn't take those steps to save the banks. But we wouldn't have been in a second Great Depression. The other part they always say to this story is, 
we could have put conditions on it. So that, that's always been the, the argument. And they're saying, oh, there's no way you could put conditions. Well, that's not true. We put conditions all the time. And if you need an example, look at what we did with Chrysler and GM. We put all sorts of conditions. We said, okay, the workers are going to get pay cuts. The bondholders are going to take a haircut. We put all sorts of conditions. So we know how to do that. But somehow when it came to the financial sector, they just said, well, we just got to give them the money. We don't know, you know, we, we can't put any conditions. We just have to give them the money. Yeah, you've been had your hand up here. Well, you said by, the best way to get out of this would just be by just spending money, basically. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, since we already had just such a giant debt, um, where would we get the money, and then how would we pay it back? Those are good questions. Um, well, two things. Uh, first off, you know, the, the size of the debt, I, I always love arguing with these uh, deficit hawks in Washington because they always go, trillions with a T. You know, okay, well, it's a lot of money. But it's kind of beside the point. What matters is how large is the debt relative to the economy. And, and it's large, you know, but it's not, it's not astronomical. It's been larger times past. After World War II, the ratio of the debt to GDP was about 115%. Currently, we're looking at uh, it's uh, about 63, 64. And it's rising, but you know, it, it's, it's well below what it was after World War II. Um, Japan has a debt to GDP ratio. I think it's about 180% now. Um, and the end of the day, I mean, the people keep spreading these horror stories, well, people are going to lose faith in the U.S. government, blah, blah, blah. Well, we could speculate about that, but the other thing we could do is we could look at the financial markets and we could see that people are putting their money on the line. They aren't just talking, they're putting their money on the line and they're willing to hold long-term treasury bills at interest rates of, you know, 3.6 percent, very low interest rates. So the evidence we have from the markets are, at least at the moment, you know, people are not worried, investors are not worried that we can't pay, pay back our debt. And the evidence we have from other countries and prior times is we can have a much, much higher debt. Now, over a long term, obviously, we can't keep having the debt to GDP issue, debt to GDP ratio rise indefinitely. Clearly, at some point, you run into problems. But I think we aren't anywhere near that point now. So I think it makes a lot of sense to say, look, we got to get the economy going again, get people back to work. Cause we do bear, I mean, this is, again, one of the things that, that I think isn't fully understood. We are going to bear permanent costs from these periods of high unemployment. I mean, there's, you know, I'm sure many of you are in a situation where it's hard to pay your, your tuition. Your parents might otherwise uh, be working. People, I'm sure some people here have had a parent uh, that have lost their jobs. It's hard, much harder to pay tuition. Um, people who have kids in school, it's, it's you know, and this is, there's a lot of research on this. It's very disruptive. Your parents lose your job. Sometimes you have to move. So you're having kids that are, you know, in elementary school today that because their parents uh, have lost their job, they're likely to have trouble keeping up in school. They might l fall behind a grade, two grades. This is going to be an enduring cost. You're going to have people that, you know, they won't get the education they should have. People just getting out of the uh, out of school, they won't get the foot up on the labor market that they would ordinarily have because the yeah, unemployment rate's so high, and you know, you're not going to be the first ones hired because they have people that have you know, been much more senior. So we're going to bear an enduring cost for this. So yeah, I don't want to see the debt go to, you know, 80, 90, 100% GDP. But the fact is, we can do that. We have done that. And we won't be able to take back the lost years here. So the years that people spent unemployed, that they weren't able to properly care for their kids because they didn't have the money, we won't ever get that back. So in terms of the trade-offs, to my mind, it's kind of a no-brainer. You don't, you, you don't tell people you can't have a job. The other thing that I just find really infuriating in, in, in this story, and it's because I hang out with economists in Washington, is the people who are unemployed didn't do anything wrong. We did. You know, economists did. We fucked up. And, you know, the idea that you should have 15 million people be unemployed and that's okay because the smart people who are supposed to know what they're doing didn't know what they're doing, that's a really hard story to tell. So, well, well, the question is, this is about President Obama's proposal that he's announcing tonight. I mean, I don't know if inside knowledge, it's been widely reported. Um, he's going to announce a three-year freeze on discretionary, non-defense discretionary spending. It's about uh, seventh of the total budget. Uh, this is a symbolic gesture. Um, it, it won't have too much impact because at the end of the day, 
you know, he's going to throw this out there and Congress is going to make some adjustments. And, you know, one of his spokespeople, Jared Bernstein, is an old friend of mine who's now working for, for President Obama. He was on a talk show. And he's going, well, it's not a hard and fast freeze. We'll have some adjustments, this and that. So I, it, it's a symbolic gesture. I don't think it will have that much impact. But having said that, I think it is harmful in terms of the rhetoric because he is the president and he should be setting the agenda, not responding to it. And the point that he should be making, at least in my view, is that we have to do everything we can to get the economy going again. And this idea that we're worried that, oh my God, the deficit's really high. We should be really happy the deficit is really high right now, because if it weren't, we'd have 12, we'd have 13, we'd have 14 percent unemployment. He has to make that clear, because the deficits are going to be high, and if they're not high, we're going to be in a much worse economic situation. So making this gesture, I think, undermines his own ability to get the stimulus we need to get the economy going. So I think, see that as the main outcome, the, the practicalities of it, how much will really be cut, will this you know, have, a, have, a, have a contractionary impact on the economy? My guess is relatively little just because it really is symbolic. It doesn't have that much impact. But I think it's, you know, in terms of setting the political stage, it's, it's 180 degrees the wrong direction. Yes? Uh, yeah, I think he's probably, you know, th this is, uh, you know, th when Obama came in the White House, it was a really extraordinary time. I mean, here you had, you know, obviously the first African-American president, you know, relatively young, very articulate, very smart person, and coming into office at a time of crisis, and the FDR moment certainly seemed appropriate at the time, because, you know, this is very similar. FDR comes in, 33, the country is collapsing. And, you know, it's his ball game suddenly. He's, you know, he comes in there and he's going, you know, comes in his 100 days, you know, he has a bank holiday, you know, he really takes charge, very ambitious agenda. And there are many people, and I'll put myself in that group, that thought, okay, well, this is an opportunity. You know, you lay out the agenda, you go there and really push for things. And, of course, you, you know, you're not going to get everything you push for, but, you know, this is really a chance. You know, you were elected with a popular mandate. You have, at that time, 59 people in the Senate, you know, which is, still, you know, the most that any, you know, president had on their side since the 60s. You know, this is really extraordinary. And he comes up with a relatively m meager agenda and doesn't really push. It doesn't really control the debate. Um, I'll compare him to Reagan here. Re president, don't agree with his policies, but very effective president in terms of pushing his agenda. Reagan controlled the debate. President Obama did not. So can he take that back? Can he turn around and somehow really Seize the, seize the moment and push through a more ambitious agenda. I think he's probably lost that opportunity. I mean, it's, you know, he had the health care, which we'll see what ends up coming of that, but it really, uh, it really proved, I think, to be kind of a fiasco. His stimulus package, um, you know, again, th this was kind of bizarre. You know, I'd go around talking in groups like this or talk to, to radio shows, uh, you know, I'm in the media, talk to people in the media, and the confusion around the stimulus package, I don't know how many people I've had say, well, we don't need more stimulus, you should focus on jobs. Okay, you should all be laughing, because that's absurd. I mean, stimulus was about creating jobs. That was the whole point of the stimulus package, as a way to create jobs. But because he did such a bad job of selling it, what's so striking, here's a very articulate, intelligent person who you know, ran an incredible campaign. The fact that he ended up as president was really amazing. You know? But somehow, you go around the country and people hear stimulus and go, oh, didn't all that money go to Wall Street? Okay, well, the TARP money went to Wall Street. The stimulus money didn't. But, you know, he, he really, really blew it. And can he turn around and get it back? It's, it's hard to see at this point. Yes? Good question. Uh, yeah. Well, it wasn't that localized, I should point out. So, so if you look across the country, there were big increases in house prices in large chunks of the country. Now, there were areas where there was nothing that unusual going on. But most of the state of California, which, you know, of course, is uh, about 10% of the, the country, 
saw a very large increase in house prices. Same is true of you know the Portland area in in, uh, in Oregon, uh, Seattle, Washington. Most of the East Coast, D.C. going northward, um, and pockets of the Midwest. Chicago had a very big run up in house prices. You know, so 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 there were large large areas. It wasn't just you know a few pockets where you saw the bubble. There were large large areas that you did see the bubble. Now there were areas. I would say most of the areas that, that there were two factors that, uh, I don't know if insulate is the right word, but two areas that, two factors, main factors that prevented some areas from being as affected. One is they tended to have less vibrant economies. So large chunks of the Midwest, they didn't have that strong job growth, the strong economic growth, um, some badly depressed. So, so that was one factor. The other was there were relatively few restrictions on building. So in, certainly in the East Coast, um, West Coast, you know, it was harder to build. These weren't absolute obstacles, but, you know, they, they did slow down the building process. And my guess, and I, I don't know anything about Iowa real estate law, but my guess is that, you know, if, if there was suddenly an increase in, in demand for housing, probably builders could fairly quickly build the capacity to, to meet that. It would take longer, certainly in New York, longer, certainly in California. So again, those aren't, you know, aren't impossible barriers. We know that because they built the housing. You know, so clearly it weren't impossible, but there would certainly be more of a lag between when the demand showed up and when the housing uh, was, was built to, to fill that demand. Yes? That's a really good question. It's so, <laughs> a really good question. Um, so is the housing bubble over? This is kind of funny. I'm I, I, a little embarrassed on this one because my, my wife and I had a condominium in, in Washington, D.C. that we sold in 2004, and we were renting, and we decided uh, recently to, to, to buy a house. So I have all these people going, oh, so, so the bubble's over. You know, it's, it's safe. And I go, no, 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 it's not. Um, I, I'd say, well, sir, first off, it depends hugely on, on the area. So some places, the bubble has fully deflated and maybe even then some. So I, I put the numbers up there for Phoenix, uh, Las Vegas. Um, the bubble has fully deflated in those areas. I, I could mention a few others, but there are some areas where the bubble is fully deflated. Now, that doesn't mean that prices won't continue to fall, but my expectation will be is that if you, th if you go out three, four, five years, they'll come back up. You know, markets overshoot on the high side, they could overshoot on the downside. That is likely to happen in both those markets, in Phoenix and Las Vegas and some others I can mention. But my guess is that those prices will come back up. Um, other markets, though, still have ways to go. Much of the Northeast, uh, Boston, uh, New York, my guess is that prices will continue to fall there. Um, one of the things, well, there have been three factors that have been holding up the housing market in the last, I'd say, six, seven months. Um, if you looked at house prices, uh, I don't know if I showed that clearly in graphs there, but house prices peak in 06, they begin to fall the second half of 06, they fall more rapidly in 07, and then they start to fall very rapidly in 08 into the early months of 09, and then they level off, and then they actually rose a little bit through, through last summer and into the fall. The reason for that, there were three reasons, all temporary, as to why they leveled off and rose. One is that we had this first time buyer's tax credit. So you got $8,000 if you bought a home for the first time or actually hadn't owned one for the last three years. So that was a big factor. $8,000 is about 5%, a little less than 5% of the median house price. So that's a fair bit of money. So that gave people an incentive if they're thinking of buying a home uh, 2010, they rushed out in 2009 and bought one, why not get the $8,000? So that was one factor. Second factor, the Federal Reserve Board, in its effort to prop up the economy, one of the things it did was buy, it's in the process of doing this, buy one and a quarter trillion dollars of mortgage-backed securities. And that pushed down mortgage interest rates to the lowest levels we've seen since the early post-World war post -World War II period. So mortgage interest rates, the 30-year mortgage rate bottomed out at, I think it was under 4.7%, extraordinarily low mortgage interest rates. Now, they're up around five today, they're supposed to end this program at the end of March. So my expectation, not just mine, most economists, expect that mortgage interest rates will rise five and a half, six percent. Not real high, but not anywhere near as low as what they were last year. Um, the first time buyer's tax credit, by the way, it was originally supposed to end at the end of, at the end of November. They extended it so that it's now scheduled to end at the end of April. Um, whether Congress extends it again or not, I don't know. My guess is probably not. Okay, so 
you lose the tax credit, you lose the really low mortgage interest rates. The third factor was the Federal Housing Authority, and this is kind of a painful story. Um, Federal Housing Authority was set up to provide uh, financing for low, moderate income people who can't afford a down payment. You could get a, a home with putting just 3.5% down if it's guaranteed by the Federal Housing Authority. That had fallen, their share of the market had fallen to about 2% in 2005, 2006. So what happened was they were nearly around 8 or 9%. It fallen to about 2% at the peak of the housing bubble. Reason was, why should you put down 3.5% as a down payment with FHA when you can put down zero on the subprime market? Okay, so they lost their market share to subprime. Well, the subprime, of course, collapses 2006, 2007. The FHA share went to 30% for purchase mortgages. Well, if you go to 30% of the market in a context where house prices are declining, and you have double-digit unemployment, you're going to make a lot of bad loans unless you're really careful. And they weren't. So the Federal Housing Authority is now below its minimum capital requirement because they took a lot of big losses on bad mortgages. So they're having to cut back their, their involvement in the market. So those three factors taken together, the end of the tax credit, the higher interest rates because the Fed ends its buying program, and the reduced role of the, the Federal Housing Authority, my expectation is that you'll see weakening of the market. I think we're already seeing evidence of this. House prices will start falling again. They probably, on a nationwide basis, have somewhere in the order of 15% more to fall. So again, there's going to be big variations by region. Always important to keep that in mind with housing. But as a nationwide average, I think we're probably going to see somewhere in the order of a 15% drop over, let's say, the next year and a half. So it might not be safe to get back in the market. Yes? Well, there's a lot of government jobs that are very productive. Uh, and I don't know many people want to lay off the police department, fire department, school teachers. Um, a lot of very. Well, there's a lot of unproductive private jobs. Uh, the the the, uh, the uh, investment bankers at Goldman Sachs, I'm not sure, if contribute that much to the economy. So, so so there's wasteful jobs in government. There's wasteful jobs in the private sector, and obviously. We want, you know, I, I was giving an example of digging ditches and filling it up again because I'm saying it's better to have someone do something that's, you know, do, do something than nothing because doing nothing, of course, is completely unproductive. Now, obviously, given our choice, we aren't going to choose to employ someone in something that's totally unproductive. We'd much rather try to have them work in something that's productive. And there are certainly things that, you know, are part of that stimulus package. We're weatherizing buildings, so that means in future years, will consume less energy. So that's certainly a productive activity. You know, maybe it's not done perfectly. You know, maybe we should weatherize building A before we do weather, uh, building B. But, you know, certainly the fact that we're weatherizing buildings as opposed to doing nothing, um, I think, you know, will make us a more productive economy in future years. Now, in terms of, you know, how did, did debt get us into this? Well, yeah, debt got us into it. Um, but it depends who's debt. You know, Bill Gates could take on a billion dollars of debt and he'd be just fine because he's got 50 billion in assets. Um, what matters is if I took on a billion dollars of debt, well, that'd probably be bad news because I don't have a billion dollars in assets. Um, so in this case, uh, can the government take on more debt? Well, we look at the evidence. The evidence is we had much more debt in years past. We were just fine. In fact, um, if, you, if you wanted to say, I'm not going to argue the causality here, but if you want to say, well, does debt help or hurt growth? Our best years of growth were in the decades after World War II when we had a huge debt burden. So I'm not going to say that was the reason we had growth, but the evidence is that it certainly didn't impede growth. So yeah, I mean, we have to be wary of having too much debt, but there's no evidence to, to think that that's going to impede growth. The other point, by the way, it's not as though we have some other option there. I mean, 
It's not as though, oh, okay, let's cut spending. Um, that's an option of 15% unemployment. That doesn't look real good to me. I mean, no one has a coherent story that says, okay, let's get the government to not spend money and we'll just do X, Y, and Z and that will get the economy going. No one has that story. So if we had that story, I'm happy to listen to it, but I haven't heard it. Uh, go ahead, you have more to say. No, it doesn't. No, it actually doesn't. That, that's, that's a really important point. Let me just emphasize this. The government, the government, all right, you get two more seconds. Okay, good, good. Thank you for taking the seconds. That's exactly the point. The government is not taking it from the private sector right now. The interest rates are not going up because the government is borrowing money. No one could say interest rates are high today, even though the government's borrowing over a trillion dollars a year. Interest rates are lower than they've been at any point since the early 50s. So the government is not taking it from the private sector. If the government doesn't spend it, no one's going to. That's the situation. No, you got your two. No, 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 you got, I, look, there are other people who have questions. We could talk later. We, we could talk later, but there's other people who have questions. Well, as I said, I think the best thing, I, I'm really fond of the work sharing program that you have in, in uh, Germany and Netherlands because, you know, what they've done is, I mean, two ways to think about this. We're in a situation where we're producing way below our potential. So on the one hand, we could try and think of ways to get the economy to its potential. And, you know, that will be somewhat wasteful. We'll do some good things, some bad things. We could do that. A lot of the things take time, though. I mean, one of the, one of the problems in the story is that if we want to do more productive things, that takes a longer period of time. So this was the big story about the shovel ready. Okay, what's on the shelf can we do tomorrow? Well, those aren't necessarily the best things to do, but the best things aren't on the shelf. We can't do them tomorrow. So if we can't expand the economy immediately to its full capacity, why not flip it over the other way and say, okay, why don't we all just work less? You know, why don't we work fewer hours? And in fact, um, you know, we do work more hours on average than people do just about anywhere else in the world. So it doesn't sound to me like that's all that bad a thing. And it's a very, very different story. Instead of having, say, 10% of your workforce be unemployed, I'll be a little glib here, suppose we all work 10% fewer hours and had the same amount of money. Um, that probably would sound pretty good. And again, since our problem is not a shortage, our problem is a lack of demand, not a lack of supply, we can, in effect, do something like that. Because, you know, we're producing enough. We, we can, in effect, do something like that. So to my mind, if we wanted to do something quickly that got people back to work, I think you're hard pressed to beat the, the uh, work sharing, sort of work sharing programs that you have in, in the Netherlands and, and Germany. And just to say, I mean, it's really quite striking. I, I was really, uh, Germany has had a sharper fall off in, in GDP than the United States, as had the Netherlands. Neither has seen any increase in their unemployment rate during this downturn. Netherlands, in fact, has an unemployment rate that's still below 4%. So the contrast, I say, is, we're experiencing the downturn in the form of double-digit unemployment. They're experiencing the downturn in the form of shorter work weeks and longer vacations. So what do you want? Yeah. You, uh, you said that the uh, supply constraints and rising incomes were not possible to have them, but later on you said supply constraints and rising incomes were actually more. We had more of a housing bubble in some places than others. Temporary, uh, yeah, the supply constraints uh, um, can lead to a temporary impact on, on prices. Because if, if, if housing, imagine housing were like cars, you know, so that we had, you know, everyone wanted to rush out and buy new cars. You know, pretty quickly, uh, General Motors and Toyota, whoever's, you know, we're getting our cars from these days, they, they, they could up their, their production levels. I mean, I suppose if we doubled demand for cars, they couldn't, it would take them a little while to do that. But, you know, if demand were to increase by 15 or 20 percent, pretty quickly the auto industry could adjust to that, and you probably wouldn't see that much of an increase in prices. On the other hand, with, with, with housing, it does take some time, and in some areas more than others. But the idea that that would be permanent, that, you know, we, we wouldn't, you know, even two years, three years, four years down the road, we wouldn't be able to meet demand. No, of course we'll be able to meet demand. 
So there's some time lag involved, and the time lag is longer in some places than others. So in an area where they have tighter restrictions on zoning and building, you'll have more of a time lag between when you see the increase in demand and when supply comes up to fill the gap. So it's not that there was nothing there. You know, clearly there are, you know, housing is, is, more, is more constrained in supply than cars or clothes or, you know, most of the other things we buy. But it's not an absolute barrier. And again, that should have been evident. So it shouldn't have been surprising that you might have had some sort of short-term increases in price here or there, but the idea that that would be enduring, that that would stick, that should have been evident that wasn't going to be the case. I don't think they're a big part. Um, yeah, I'd have to think more carefully about that. On, on the face of it, the worst lending practices were in, uh, well, actually, no, that would contribute to the bubble. So the worst lending practices were in the areas where the bubble was, was, uh, was, was uh, most inflated. So, you know, if you look at where you had the, the you know, a lot of Alt-A loans, a lot of subprime, you know, it was California, it was Las Vegas, it was uh, uh, Florida. So, so that, that probably did play a role. And I know uh, I have friends in Vermont who keep touting that, you know, Vermont has sort of very old-fashioned banking, but they actually did have somewhat of a run-up in prices. Not as not as bad as uh, Florida or um, Nevada, but uh, but they did some somewhat of a run up. So I, I think differences in lending practice surely had to play a role, but I, I don't think I don't think that was exclusively what was going on. Okay, way in back. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so the question is, the, the Fed has bought up or it's on, in line to buy up one and a quarter trillion dollars of mortgage-backed securities. So is there much risk that the Fed is going to lose money on that? And in fact, that's the taxpayers losing money. I've been somewhat concerned about that. I mean, it's, you know, it won't be disastrous. We could afford it. But, you know, you'd want to know if we're taking on commitments where you're going to lose money. I mean, substantial sums. I mean, if it's nickel and dime stuff. But you know, one and a quarter trillion, not that we're going to lose one and a quarter trillion, but, you know, if we invest one and a quarter trillion and 10% go bad, that's 125 billion. I'd want to know if we're going to, you know, be throwing 125 billion out the door. Now, what the Fed has said is that they're, they're just buying up, you know, the top rated securities, which, you know, I'm willing to believe is probably true, but we know that being top rated securities doesn't necessarily mean that much. So I would be, I, I am somewhat concerned that we might take a hit on that. Um, I guess I've been doing my best to avoid looking at it just because I don't want to think about it. But uh, um, it's, you know, it's one of these things. I, I wish the Fed had not done that. I mean, they're, they're, the, the Fed, uh, the, the, this is an unusual measure for the Fed because uh, the way the Fed ordinarily intervenes in, in, in financial markets is they intervene at the short end, overnight money. So we have the, what's called the federal funds rate. This is the rate that banks lend to each other so that they can meet their minimum reserve requirements. When the Fed wants to be expansionary, it puts reserves in that lowers the overnight rate. When it wants to be contractionary, it pulls reserves out that raises the overnight rate. But this is literally overnight lending. So what was really extraordinary here is rather than just lending overnight, they're talking about buying up 10-year you know, mortgage-backed securities. These are 10-year, 30-year mortgages. So they're getting directly into the long-term market with the idea of pushing down long-term rates. Now, I think that's the right policy, but I would not have done that by going through the mortgage-backed securities market. I would have just bought more treasuries, buy 10-year treasury bonds. And that doesn't have this differential effect on the housing market, because I really don't think that they should be trying to support the housing market right now. I think it makes sense for them to try to keep long-term rates down as a way of boosting the economy generally but no reason to focus specifically on the housing market. And also, you don't take this additional risk that you might be getting mortgage-backed securities that end up going bad. So you know, they claim that they've been careful in what they've been buying and there aren't going to be big problems. But I'm worried that, yes, we may find out that uh, th they do take some losses on that. And you know, it's just not the way I want to see us throw away money. Yeah, quick follow-up.
Okay, so I assume your question is in effect that should we see, expect to see inflation because we've put all this money into the system? Um, I, I don't really think so unless the Fed just doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't exercise good care, and it would uh, be really surprising to me. So, so, so the story, the, the inflation story goes: we put all this money into the economy, and you know that's the economy is going to start to pick up, and then just you know we'll get this huge excess demand, and we'll have this big problem of runaway inflation. And my response to that would be that that would really require extraordinary negligence on the Fed's part, because inflation doesn't just go like that. You know what you'd see if we if we were to see that, you know, that the economy start to pick up and there are going to be problems, you would see the unemployment rate would start to fall. I mean, we have all this data. We get, you know, by the day, you know, that uh, we'd see, you know, more construction, more factory production. I mean, we'd know what was going on. The Fed would have ample time to start withdrawal reserves from the system. So I think the risk that you would have any sort of story where you get runaway inflation, I think that's really, really small. I mean, the Fed would just have to exercise enormously bad judgment that as the economy start to grow and as you know, the res as resources begin to get tighter, people we begin to get full employment. They just sat on their hands and didn't do anything. You know, that would then we would get inflation. But I just can't imagine that happening. The, the Fed has never been that irresponsible, so it's very hard hard for me to imagine that sort of scenario. We should probably uh, call it an evening. Uh,